Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And greetings in the name of Jesus Christ to all who are here and all who are following us on Facebook. Let me ask you if you're able to, to please stand for our call to worship. Your words are in yellow today. Return to the Lord your God. Confess to the Lord your God. Repent to the Lord your God. Praise the Lord your God. Worship the Lord your God. Together, let us worship God. Please remain standing for our song, which is, How Great is Our God. The splendor of a king, hold in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in love, darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God. We'll see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, grave is in his hand, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great is my God. Sing with me, how great is my God. See how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of our grace. My heart will sing how great. is that next Sunday, April the 3rd, we will be worshiping in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock. Um, there's a reminder, masks are optional but recommended. Uh, we will have social distancing. We have the pew, every other pew marked off. We will sing. We will have Bibles and hymnals. At 10 o'clock, there will be a streaming only service from this room. No participants other than those who are doing it. We're simply streaming it on Facebook since we're not able yet to stream from uh, the sanctuary at 11. So that we will not have worshipers in here at 10 o'clock next Sunday. So those of you who are used to seeing us streaming, we'll be streaming at 10 o'clock, not at 11 o'clock, but you can watch it later if you have something else at 10 o'clock like Sunday school. So Let's see, tomorrow night we have six o'clock finance meeting, seven o'clock administrative board. If you want the Zoom links for those, uh, they were on church chat. And Relay for Life is coming up on April the 23rd. It is a one-day event, again, as it was last year. 
The announcement I was given said we need volunteers to help prep on Friday, April the 22nd and help cook or serve at Relay on the 23rd. So if you'd like to help with that, go ahead and get ready. I believe Rhonda Gillespie has been heading that up in the past. I have not heard that she's not doing it this year. She so is. maybe get in touch with her. She is? She is. So get in touch with Rhonda if you'd like to help with Relay for Life on April the 23rd. The uh, Vietnam veterans are having a welcome home celebration. It's called a walk to the wall. It will start at Lord of Life Lutheran Church for Vietnam veterans. You know where that is. It's over on Abersboro Road. It'll proceed to the wall at Lake Benson on Saturday, April the 2nd. That's this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. The 2D Marine Aircraft Wing Band and Parade Grand Marshal Joe Marm, a Medal of Honor recipient, are expected to lead the march. U.S. Marine Colonel Samuel Lee Meyer, a Garner native, will be the keynote speaker after a concert by the band at the wall. Our Vietnam veterans will have the opportunity to place items at the wall near the conclusion of the event. One of our own St. Andrews members who is a Vietnam veteran, Bobby Deese, will be in the parade. And uh, we have had other Vietnam veterans in our congregation. I know David Woodward was a Vietnam veteran. Are there any other Vietnam veterans here today? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Don Aldridge is a Vietnam vet. Please stand if you're a Vietnam veteran. Let's have all of our Vietnam veterans to stand today. If able, stand or raise your hand, Vietnam veterans. Thank you. Thank you so much for your service, and I hope that we'll all be able to go out and show our support for our Vietnam veterans, who, as we remember, were not welcomed home as they should have been in the 1970s. So this is coming up on Saturday, April the 2nd, starting at 2 o'clock. Moving on to our joys and celebrations, I want to thank the, uh, the crew that came out and cleaned up in the sanctuary in Narthex last week in preparation for our returning on April the 3rd. So thank you so much uh, to those who were a part of that. It looked good. Just a few more things need to be done over there. We'll have our custodian come in and finish that off and we'll be ready by next Sunday. Are there any other joys and celebrations today before we move to concerns? Moving to our concerns, please continue to pray for Wanda Long, for Vicki Graham, for Rick Limley, who had eye surgery last week, for Ron Morrow, who had surgery and is also having some heart problems, and for our former pastor, Glenda Johnson, who had gallbladder surgery and is recovering from that. We also ask for prayers for Tina Garner and for Erica Rojas. Please pray for our cancer patients in our congregation. For those who are recovering from surgery, that list keeps getting longer. And for those who are having medical tests or have had them and are awaiting the results from those. Continue to pray for our shut-ins, for folks like the Yales, for Gene Holbrook, and many others. And please pray for family members of members of our church. That would include Doug's father, Hal, Har Hal Harwood, who's not doing well, Tom Blaylock, Lee's father, and Joel Youngblood's uh, great nephew, Wayne Youngblood, I told you, has stage four cancer. Uh, his blood cell count, white cell count plummeted last week. He had to go into the hospital, but he is back home. At the same time, his sister, Emery, had severe GI pain and has been in the hospital as well, uh, having CAT scans. So a lot of prayers for that family. I can't imagine what it would be like to have two ch small children in your household both be that sick at the same time. So prayers for all of them. Um, also, I've asked for prayers for Adam Castile. Adam is the son of Joseph Castile. Joe is the pastor at Garner United Methodist. Adam has been in the hospital at Duke since March the 11th and is very sick. So please pray for the Castile family. And obviously, let us continue to lift up the people of Ukraine for all of those involved in that fighting, the Ukrainians, and for the Russian soldiers as well, who many of them don't even know why they're there. Uh, I feel like in many ways they're victims just as much as the Ukrainians are. So we want to pray for that entire terrible, terrible situation. And I think especially the people of the city of Mariupol, a three, city of 300,000 that has been so absolutely devastated, including an attack on a movie theater where folks were trying to get away from it and 300 were killed in one attack. So we want to pray for that. Also, let's remember the families of the four Marines who were killed in the helicopter accident in Norway last week. I noticed today that our flags are at half 
Uh, our flags are at half for Madeline Albright, but the flags will be at half starting tomorrow for the four Camp Lejeune Marines who passed away. Are there other concerns you'd like to lift up today? Raise your hand high or stand up where I can see you. Yes, Kathy. Karen King. Thank you, Karen King. Thank you for reminding Karen King who's very sick. Yes, Linda. Brian's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Ann. What if all these younger brothers, Roger, uh, is diagnosed with stage four cancer? Roger D. Roger D. Thank you. Any others? Thank you for sharing those, and we'll be praying over those later in the service. I want to thank you all again for your continued financial support for the mission and ministry of St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. If you're able and you'd like to continue that support, there's a basket at the back for you to put something in, or you can come by the church during the week and put it in our locked mailbox, or you can go to our website, www.standrewsumc.org, press the green button at the top of the, of the web page, and it will lead you through the process of online giving, which is safe and convenient. God bless all of you for all that you do for St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. scripture lesson today and a short one. The long lesson comes from Luke chapter 15. It's the entire chapter. Luke 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep her house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between the sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. 
I'll get up and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him coming and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they all began to celebrate. Now his elder son was still in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has come back and your father's killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed a command and yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that's mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. The second passage comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is... In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we're ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of the prodigal son is one of the best known of Jesus' short stories, or parables as they're commonly known. A man has two sons. The younger one asks to receive his inheritance in advance before his father actually dies. So he's given half the estate. And by the way, that wasn't unusual back then. And even today, it's still sometimes done. The older son stays home and continues to work for his father. The younger son travels off to a far country, takes his money with him, and spends all of it on self-indulgent living. And very soon he's broke, and he's forced to work taking care of pigs. The pigs are eating carob pods, which are not very tasty, but at least barely nutritious, but he can't even have any of those. And so he gets tired of being hungry, and he decides that if he's going to have to work in the fields, he might as well work in his father's fields because at least his father's men are fed. And so he decides what he's going to do. He's going to say something to his dad to get back in his good graces, or at least he's going to make his father sorry enough for him to take him back. And he heads back towards home. But before he can even get home, the father sees him coming from the distance. Before he can get a word out, the dad embraces him and kisses him. And then the father calls for a grand celebration and gives his youngest son a new robe and sandals and a ring. Meanwhile, the oldest son is still working out in the fields and he hears the commotion. And when he discovers that his brother has come home, he's not happy, he's furious. He says he won't have any part in the celebration because he's been a good son all these years and nobody has even given him a party. And the father tells them that his brother was as good as dead, but now he's back. And besides, all that his father has will still be his oldest son's someday. That hasn't changed. I want to dig deeper into this story, but first I need to point out a few things about it. Number one, the story's setting. A crowd has gathered around Jesus, and that crowd includes sinners. 
tax collectors, Pharisees, and scribes. And you may wonder when the Bible says sinners. That's a pretty generic term, isn't it? But what it means is specifically people that had broken Jewish laws and had not yet made amends for it in the eyes of the Pharisees and scribes. The Pharisees and scribes were the ones who decided somebody was a sinner. Sinners, tax collectors, remember they're working for the Roman Empire. The Pharisees who were the teachers of the law and the scribes who worked with them. They're all there. The sinners and tax collectors would have been shunned and avoided by the Pharisees and scribes. They would have stayed away from them. They thought it made them unclean to be near them and touch them. The Pharisees and scribes were unhappy with Jesus because not only was he drawing big crowds and they weren't, he was also flaunting their rules by associating with the low life. Now this is pretty much the same reaction that many people I know would have if I were to hold a Bible study in a bar or nightclub. They would say, what is he doing associating with those kinds of people? I don't want my preacher around those kind of people. That's pretty much how the Pharisees and scribes thought about Rabbi Jesus. That's the first thing about this story. Second, the story of the prodigal is preceded by two other short parables. A man has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, and so he stops everything and he hunts for that lost sheep until he finds it, and then he has a big party to celebrate. A woman has ten silver coins, which by the way would have been ten days worth of wage for a normal worker. That's a lot of money. She loses one. She stops what she's doing, she searches her whole house until she finds it, and then she has a big party to celebrate that she's found her lost money. And in both cases, we're told that God rejoices more over one sinner who repents than over many righteous persons who do not need to repent. And yet third, third point about these stories is that neither a sheep nor a coin can repent. They're inanimate objects, and in both cases, the sheep and the coin are lost by the one who owns them. God can't lose any of us. So if the sheep owner and the woman are not supposed to symbolize God in those stories, then the connection between the story of the prodigal and repentance is not really clear. Maybe repentance in these stories doesn't mean saying you're sorry for being bad which is what I said last week. Maybe repentance means something else. Fourth, the youngest son doesn't ever really repent. It's clear from the context of the story that he's hungry, not remorseful over blowing his inheritance. His words about repentance are intended to get him something to eat, not turn his life around. And fifth, when you consider that the youngest son has been given expensive clothing now and jewelry and will probably now get paid to work for his father, remember whose money funds all of that. It's the father's money whose property would have all gone to his oldest son. In other words, the youngest son has not only used up all of his own inheritance, now he's back to start taking from his brothers. No wonder the older brother is angry. I would be too. Details matter in these stories, especially in the stories of Jesus. Everything means something in those stories. There are no wasted details. Now, given what I've just said, how do you read the story of the prodigal son? Is it about our need to repent? That's how it is usually preached. But if that's true, why doesn't anybody in the story actually repent? Is it about our need to give up resentment or entitlement that certainly seems to be the older son's problem right he's resentful and he feels entitled the older son is usually depicted as being wrongly angry but is he wrongly angry i actually think his irritation is justified usually that resentment and entitlement thing is imputed over to the audience in other words what you may have been told is that the sinners and tax collectors represent the youngest son and the scribes and Pharisees represent the oldest son, and God is the father. And that's not a bad take on the story, but it has flaws. For one thing, the father actually lost track of his youngest son. He didn't know where he was. God doesn't lose track of us. The youngest son really did need to repent of his poor choices, as did all the sinners and tax collectors in the audience. But he never repented. And Jesus would not have justified the resentment of the Pharisees and scribes toward him 
Remember, they're all mad at him. He would not have justified their anger by telling them a story that made them look like they were right. It's the story about forgiveness and inclusiveness. It's the story about how we ought to welcome any person, no matter who they are or what they've done, just as the father did in taking back his self-indulgent younger son. I think that's a pretty good take on the story, and I've preached it that way, but it doesn't really line up with the two parables that came before it. The man with the lost sheep and the woman with the lost coin were actively searching for what they had lost. And that's how we ought to act if we're trying to be merciful and tolerant to others. We don't wait until people come to us and say they're sorry. But the father hadn't been looking for his lost son. The son had to come to him. I hope you can see that the story of the prodigal son is not perhaps as cut and dried as you might have once thought or you might have been taught. And that shouldn't surprise us because the parables of Jesus are not neat and tidy with an easy to discern moral. They're tricky stories. They make us ask questions and they make us question our assumptions. They work a little bit like jokes. We hear a joke and we either have an aha moment and we get the joke right away or we're thinking, I didn't get that. And we'll think about it, and we'll think about it, and we'll think about it, and then we'll wake up in the middle of the night and we'll say, oh, I get it now. That's how parables work. The story of the prodigal son is a parable that most of us think we get, but I'm not sure we really do. We may learn some good lessons from it, but I'm not sure they're the lessons Jesus intended us to learn. It helps sometimes if we can see how the parable might have affected the people that originally heard it. It would have had to make sense to them. And remember, it was a mixed group of sinners and religious types who were hearing it. How might it have impacted them? When Jesus started that story with, there was a man who had two sons, his Jewish audience would have immediately thought of the other stories they had heard about a father with two sons. Adam and Cain and Abel. Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. Joseph and Esau and Jacob. It was a kind of story they told, a father with two sons. Now you might not realize it immediately, but in each of those stories, the younger son, Abel, Isaac, Jacob, they were the younger of the two sons. In those stories, the younger son is always the good guy. And the older sons, Cain, Ishmael, and Esau are the bad guys. Jesus' listeners would have been prepared for that kind of story where the younger son was the good guy and the older son was the bad guy. But he immediately pulls the rug out from under them because in his story, the younger son is selfish and unwise. In his story, the older son is the loyal, hardworking one. So as Jesus usually did in his parables, he is subverting their expectations. He does this a lot. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans were looked down on in Jesus' day. And religious types were admired in Jesus' day. But in that story, Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero. And the religious types who pass the wounded man by are the bad guys. It's a powerful rhetorical technique. You tell an audience something that shocks them. They're taken aback by it. What is he saying? If you do that, not only will they pay attention, their state of mind will be such that you might even sneak something new in there for them to learn. Switching the roles of the younger and older brothers in the story was not Jesus' only trick. The bad son never actually repents either. He says the right words, but we all know that he's just being selfish. He's thinking of his own hunger. Doesn't end the way we think it will. The story ends without anybody ever having repented. And that too would have shocked everybody, from the prostitutes and tax collectors who were constantly being told by the Pharisees and scribes that they had to repent, to the Pharisees and scribes that were constantly telling everybody else that they had to repent. No one would have been expecting a story where there isn't any obvious repentance. Everybody expected a story about repentance as they understood it. Somebody tells and shows God that they're sorry for who they are, for what they've done, but instead, what they got was a story showing them that they might not really understand what repentance is. 
And not only that, Jesus doesn't even end this story. It ends with things up in the air. The younger son is all decked out for the party. He's the same man he was before. He hasn't changed. Will he ever realize how much his father loves him? Will he ever start living like a person who is loved and forgiven? The older son is off by himself, pouting and saying mean things to his own father. Will his heart ever soften enough to let him celebrate the reunion with the rest of his family? We don't know. And will the father be able to grasp that he may have been neglecting his sons since one of them had gotten so self-centered and the other one was so resentful? Will he ever think to himself, maybe I messed up somewhere? Everybody walked away from the story that day, scratching their head. The sinners were glad to hear a story where sinners get a break, but it must have made them a little bit uneasy that that younger son never repented of his ways. The religious types, no doubt, felt very justified in their own exclusive behavior because the gooder guy in the story, the better guy, the older son, was a lot like them. But I have to believe that they knew that his harsh attitude wasn't really what Jesus was recommending. And then there were probably in the audience that day who were like the father, people like the father, who were involved in some situation in their own life where they had a family member or a friend who had gone astray and they weren't sure how they were supposed to respond to that. Obviously, they shouldn't shun or avoid a family or family member or friend who has gone astray. That's not what Jesus was saying. But should they really reach out first and not wait for that estranged person to come to himself like the younger son did. That was a new concept for them, that they should take the initiative. This is how parables work, folks. They upend our expectations, they leave us with questions, they break our hearts and our minds wide open so that God can get in. I confess that I have not always read the story of the prodigal son this way. I used to read it as a story about forgiveness and inclusiveness and tolerance, and it certainly lends itself to that. But I had a good teacher Dr. Amy Jill Levine, she teaches at Vanderbilt. She's an expert both in the Jewish faith and in the parables of, Jew, of Jesus. And she taught me that to understand what Jesus intended, and that should matter to us, what he intended for us to know, because he's our Lord. To understand what Jesus intended, we have to know how the people of his time would have heard these stories. It's so easy for us to assume that the way that we were taught to understand them as 20th and 21st century Christians. It's easy for us to think that's exactly what God intended, but I think that we often make that mistake because we forget that Jesus may have meant something entirely different to the people who were hearing it. Dr. Levine says the story of the prodigal son is not about repentance as we've always imagined it. It's not, all, it's not about telling God you're sorry. It's a story about reconciliation. It's a story about bringing back together again people who have fallen apart think back to those first two parables what was important to the sheep owner that the sheep who was wandered off was once again part of the flock that was all important to him what was important to the woman with the coin that the coins she had lost could go back in the purse with the other nine coins in both stories what had been diminished was once again made whole and that was why they celebrated those sheep were meant to be together in a flock. Those coins were meant to be together in her purse. What was wrong had been made right. And it doesn't matter how the sheep got lost or how the coin got lost. That doesn't matter at all. What's more important is they're now back where they're supposed to be. With the story of the prodigal, that is even more pronounced and more poignant. The father is overjoyed because his boy is back home. He doesn't really care what happened to him. His family is together again. And it's obvious that the two sons have yet to understand this. The youngest son didn't appreciate his family in the first place, or he wouldn't have taken all of his money and run off to a far country. The older son is more concerned about punishing his brother than he is about his father's joy or about his family being together again. They didn't get it the way the father did. The story of the prodigal son is about reconciliation. What matters most to God is that we stay together, folks. Or if we've become divided, that we come back together again. Only if we are not separated from each other can we have an environment where we can safely repent.
and change our lives. If a family falls apart because of the behavior of one or more members, how can they make things right unless they come back together? I can't forgive you if you refuse to talk to me. You can't forgive me if I turn my back on you. We have to be back together for us to be able to repent and get our lives straight. Yes, God wants repentance from each one of us. As I said last week, God wants us to turn away from the regrets of the past and the worries about tomorrow so that we can live in the present. God wants us to turn away from self-centeredness and self-indulgence to healthy self-love and selfless care for others. But we can't do any of that if we're not in relationship with each other. Reconciliation, bringing us back together again after we have been separated is inseparable from repentance. They go together like this. That's the meaning of the story of the prodigal son. Maybe, just maybe, the two sons will see their father's joy at having his boys together again. And maybe they will change their lives and become more like him. I suspect few people have heard this particular interpretation of the prodigal son. We have all been so indoctrinated into thinking that it's either about being sorry for our sins or being tolerant of other people's sins that I suspect few of us will look beyond what we already know to a more authentic understanding of what Jesus said. But I'm convinced Dr. Levine is right because this is also how the Apostle Paul understood Jesus. Let's turn to that second scripture today from 2 Corinthians. Paul starts with these words. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we now know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. What is Paul saying? He's saying that because of Jesus, we who follow Jesus don't see people. We don't see the world the way that we used to. We have new eyes. In Christ, we no longer make assumptions about other people because we know that everybody has a unique story. We don't judge everybody by our own moral standards and then mistreat the people who don't live up to our standards. That doesn't mean we don't hold each other accountable for our actions, but judging is God's responsibility. And we don't use people as a means to an end. We don't lie, we don't manipulate, we don't threaten, we don't hurt each other. Those are all the things that we do when we regard each other from a human viewpoint. We see each other as objects to be manipulated for our own ends. But we don't do that anymore in Christ. And Paul gained this new perspective from his own relationship with Christ and from the people he knew that were in Christ that were now living a different kind of life. It's a new way of living that he's talking about. Paul calls it being in Christ. And when we live that way, the world looks different to us. It's as though there is a new creation. Every person, every group, every organization looks different to us when we are in Christ. Paul continues, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. There's the word. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting our trespasses against us and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. When God became a human being in Jesus Christ and died on the cross, that was God's means both of forgiving us everything and of showing us that we have been forgiven. It's a done deal, folks. We don't have to do anything to earn God's mercy. It was a gift. God did it for us because God made us and God loves us. That's all. God gave us that gift on the cross. And the purpose of it all was reconciliation, making what was wrong right again, balancing accounts, paying off debts, bringing back together that which had been divided. In Christ, God has done everything God can do to reconcile us all. That includes our friendships, our romantic relationships and marriages, our families, our businesses, our governments, and yes, that includes our churches. God doesn't want us to turn our backs on each other. God doesn't want us to run off to a far country, so to speak. God doesn't want us to refuse to welcome people back home. None of that is God's will. When Christians create divisions and then we reinforce them, 
What we're doing when we do that is we are declaring to the world that we reject what Jesus did, us, did for us on the cross. When we divide ourselves from each other, when we put our foot down and say, no, this is the line in the sand. All we're saying to the world is we don't really believe what happened on the cross. We reject the reconciliation that God has already accomplished. The radical idea that we're not supposed to draw lines in the sand, that we're not supposed to constantly split the world into us and them. The idea that we're supposed to stop doing all that is so controversial that people who thrive on division ridicule the idea and try to silence anybody who promotes it. Yes, there are people who thrive on division. We know it. All we have to do is look at the world around us. To the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day, reconciliation to them meant accepting Gentiles and Romans and sinners, just as that father welcomed his younger son. Reconciliation meant overcoming their natural resentment and opening their arms to embrace people they didn't like. And this made them so mad that they conspired with their own enemies and had Jesus killed on a cross. They chose murder over reconciliation. That's how much they opposed this new idea that we're all supposed to be together. They were not going to have it. Reconciliation is fundamental. Reconciliation and repentance are inseparable because people have to believe that forgiveness is possible before they'll turn around and they'll begin acting as forgiven. And without reconciliation, people don't believe forgiveness is possible. We were not made to be divided into thousands of little competing groups. We were made to go through life together, folks. We were made to weather suffering and death together. We are a family of people created equal in the eyes of a loving God. It's a revolutionary message. Jesus lived it, Jesus taught it, and Jesus died for it. And if we took it seriously, how different would our concerns be? Methodism's 50-year debate over human sexuality would have been very different if our goal from the beginning had been reconciliation <clears throat> and not division. We would now be split up into factions that want each other to cease existing. <clears throat> How would the continuous war that we have learned to live with, because we do, folks, we live with war all the time. How would that look to people who believe that God is all about reconciliation and not division? And Paul is not finished with us, church. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. If we truly accept that Jesus died so that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God and to each other, then we're going to want to tell everybody about that. And more importantly, we're going to live that life of reconciliation. We're going to finish the unfinished story of the loving father by forgiving people before they're genuinely sorry. We're not going to wait for people to come back to us on their knees begging. We're going to forgive others just as God has forgiven us, knowing that our mercy may change their hearts. We're going to treat them well. We're going to embrace them and give them our best, knowing that our acceptance and generosity may save their lives. We're going to finish the unfinished story of the younger son by acknowledging God's mercy in Christ and living our lives as grateful, forgiven people. <clears throat> We're not going to throw away the gift that God gives us. We're going to finish the unfinished story of the older son by loving sinners and hating our own sin and leaving everybody else's sin between them and God. If we accept that Jesus died so that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God and to each other, We'll dedicate our lives to bringing people together, not keeping them apart through fear, intolerance, indifference, or resentment. Reconciliation. It's not a set of rules that we have to follow to pass a test and go to heaven. It's a way of life to live today and every day. It's a way to see the world as God sees it, with new eyes. Friends, as a fellow minister of reconciliation, because we are all called to this, I implore you, bring broken people back to God by welcoming them and accepting them and loving them. Bring divided people back to each other by refusing to walk away or turn your back. 
This is how we take the cross of Christ upon our own grateful shoulders. This is how we bring honor and glory to God. This is the way of Christ. This is the way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The song is Blessed Be Your Name, and you're invited to stand as able and sing it together. Blessed be your name, land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, we'll found in the desert place, I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering There's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take Say, Lord, blessed be your name. Amen. That's, uh, do we have the prayer of reconciliation up? We did that affirmation last week. Okay, I will, lead, I will do it. <clears throat> you can repeat after me. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for all those from whom we are estranged. Bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us, Forgive us 
for the times we have wronged others. Grant us the courage to seek their forgiveness and the opportunity to make amends. Where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive even as we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, the one of prodigal grace, we give you thanks for the gift of life and for the blessings of this life. We thank you for family and friends and for love abundant. We lift up all of those persons whose names we called aloud earlier, church members, friends, family members, acquaintances, people in countries that we have never even met, and we ask your blessings of mercy and wholeness and healing upon them all. Lead us through the trials, the suffering and the sorrow, the challenges and the struggles, the tired times and the despair and the bleak places. Lead us back to you and to your love abundant. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, who have no peace, who seek release. Be with them and comfort them with your love abundant. Strengthen those who now endure the violence or threat of war. Give hope to people whose voices have been silenced. Encourage them with hope and with your love abundant. And to those who have heard or silenced them, bring profound repentance and a thirst for reconciliation. Inspire us to love each other enough to welcome each other back home in joy and love abundant. Sustain us in your mercy with patience and stamina, upheld by your Holy Spirit and your prodigal grace. Transform us in all our broken ways. Transform us that we can be made whole and in wholeness. May we become the hands and heart of Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to move our passing to peace time to after the close of the service. You're welcome to stay and greet each other. Let me go ahead and send you out. Christians gathered here today, brothers and sisters in faith, all who wish to be a sign of reconciliation through the power of the cross. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the children of God, the ministers of reconciliation, all said together, Amen. Amen.